What's going on everybody and welcome back. So for the people viewing for the first time, it's never heard of me. The reason I use the name Heavy Forge is because I'm a heavy equipment mechanic here in Alaska and I work in the road construction industry. So I wrench all summer long, then I forge full time in the winter. So with that being said, I'm not gonna be going to the store to buy my steel, I'm gonna be making it. And I'm gonna be making my dagger from what's known as Wootz Damascus or Crucible Steel. And I'll take you through my process. So let's head over to the anvil and we'll talk about the material I use and why I use that material. All right, so bear with me. There is a few things worth explaining. So I use two materials to make my woods, and that's electrolytic iron flake, which looks like this. It's a very pure iron. And then for my carburizer, which is what's going to add carbon to the iron, I use sorrel metal, also known as pig iron. Um, it's a very pure and clean cast iron, and it's 4.25% carbon. So there's a variety of reasons I like to use this material. And one of those is historical accuracy. So using these two materials is gonna give you a traditional chemistry, meaning that your chemistry is going to align with the real thing. And I'm not really trying to be historically accurate. I just happen to have access to this material. This stuff is really hard to find, especially sorrel metal. Um, I just happen to have a connect for it, so I use it. And also, you know what you're working with. There's no variables, there's no guessing. So calculating your carbon content is really simple. Um, I'm going to be going for a 1,605 gram ingot. Um, that's 1,000 grams of iron, 605 grams of sorrel. So that'll give me a carbon content of 1.6%. And I'll probably bump that up just a little in case I lose some carbon uh, during the roast or from forging. Um, and also, this is all you need. Um, there's no need to add any carbide forming elements. There's no need to add any um, vanadium, um, although it certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, it all just depends on how historically accurate you want to be. Um, now, with Woots being a very pure steel, um, the hardenability of it is very low. Uh, it's basically free of manganese, so it's a shallow hardening steel. So if you were to add some manganese um, to this charge, it, it wouldn't hurt. Uh, it all just depends on how um, historically accurate you want to be. And also, uh, it does depend on how you stack your crucible. So Using these two materials, you're going to want to put your iron in first, then your sorrel, and then your green glass on top of your sorrel. So with that being said, let's go make some steel. So now that the crucible is loaded up and in the furnace, it's a good time to talk about a few things. So I use salamander super crucibles, which are clay graphite crucibles. And I've been doing open melts, meaning my crucibles are not capped, which produces great ingots, but now that I'm more confident in my process and have an S-type thermocouple I'll be installing in my furnace, I'll be capping my crucibles in future melts, which makes more consistent and higher quality ingots. It's also good to note that the furnace needs to achieve temps of at least 27 to 2900 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you really don't want to go over 2900 degrees because if melt temps are too high, the silica in the glass starts to have negative reactions. I'd say it's best to hang around 2800 degrees. That's why a thermocouple is beneficial. And also, the purpose of the glass is to protect a charge from oxidation. So it's been 45 minutes into this melt, and right here I'm just ensuring that the charge is liquid, which it is. So at this point, I'll turn the air and gas down until the inside of the crucible becomes placid, as you can see here. And I'll let it run for about another 15 minutes before shutting off the furnace. I just cut the gas and the air off, and when it cools down a little more, I'll bring it on in the garage. Stay tuned. All right, so it seems the melt went well. Um, the crucible's been sitting in the furnace all night, so it's completely cool. Um, let's go ahead and break it open and see what we got.
All right, so the next thing I like to do is spark test the ingot, and I'm gonna compare it with some other materials here, this being wrought iron. It doesn't spark very much. Now this is 52100, and as you can see, it has a very prominent burst of sparks. Now here's the ingot, and as you can see, it bursts very well. I'm very happy with that. And so the next thing I like to do is grind in a little window. I'll grind a corner, a top corner of the ingot off and polish it up and then etch it. All right, so here I'm etching the window with 2% nitol. And I've learned that this is a pretty beneficial step. It's good to know what kind of structure you have before you go to forging. It just gives you an idea of, um, you know, how you're going to go about forging or maybe how long to roast for. And this structure you're looking at here is called a needle-like structure or a Widmanstatten structure. It's pretty typical for um, material that's very pure and low in carbide forming elements. And this is a close-up shot of it with a microscope. All right, so the next step is the roast. And this is a very critical step. I roast for three hours at 1,922 degrees. And as you can see here, it's almost finished. And once it's finished, I take that ingot out of that kiln and I go straight to the press. I do not mess around. I go straight to forging. And I'm very gentle at first. The footage is sped up here, but I take it pretty easy as I consolidate the ingot into a bar. And if you were to skip the roast and take the ingot out of the crucible and go straight to forging, the likelihood of failure is extremely high. And without getting too deep, um, you know, you roast for so long because you want to dissolve all those carbides. You know, you want to ensure that all those carbides get dissolved. And you're basically changing that solidification structure and preparing the ingot to be forged. All right, so once I get the ingot consolidated into a rectangle bar, as you can see here, I'll start to work in more heavy forging. Another thing to keep in mind is ingot orientation. And I'll explain a little bit about that at the end of this. So this is a good point to stop and explain a few things. Um, if you see this line here, okay, this is the top of the ingot. So you kind of want to pay attention to orientation as you're forging. Being that this is going to be a dagger, we don't want that crappy area of the ingot, um, which is, you know, the top part of the ingot. We don't want that on the, uh, on the edge where our, you know, um, our edge is going to be on our dagger. So it's best to uh, put it on the face here. And as you can see, there's still a lot of material left. There's a lot of material in 1,600 grams. So this is a, um, a good point to grind this all out now, which kind of sucks, you know, when you're making a dagger, it's just, it's inevitable. You have to, uh, you have to get rid of that um, or else that's gonna show up in the pattern, you know, if you just left it there. And I don't want that. That's the uh, next step. Then we'll uh, forge the blade and heat treat and go from there, so stay tuned. So it's worth mentioning that initial forging should be done above ACM or of pure austenite. And here I've inserted a picture of the iron carbon phase diagram, which is a representation of phase change in steel as it's heated or cooled. And here I've highlighted the ACM line in red.
As the bevels are ground, the pattern becomes clearly visible even at 36 grit, as you can see here. So in the next clip I'll be quenching, and with Wootz being a shallow hardening steel, Hamon is spontaneous and pretty much inevitable. And quench temperature is 1425 and soaked for 5 minutes. You don't want to soak too long because you can't erase your pattern. So the quench went great and I tempered the blade for two two hour cycles at 400 degrees. I also finished ground the blade off camera. And here I'm just rummaging through my handle material drawer and I really wanted to use a set of that Alaskan Jade scales, but that stuff's extremely difficult to shape without the proper tooling, which I don't have. So I went with a set of moose antler scales and moose antler once polished up looks like ivory, which I think will complement this dagger very well. Something else worth mentioning is etching woots, and it can be a real pain. I'm hand sanding up to 800 grit here, and that's where I'll be etching at. And I found that 2% night all works best with my chemistry, and that's what I'll be using to etch this dagger. Some have success with acids such as oxalic and even coffee, but I haven't had success with any of those, even with different chemistries. And all it takes is a quick 30 second dip in night all to get a really good etch. And there you have it, that's what it's all about. So if you're wondering how the pattern is created, well simply put, it's due to iron carbide and the carbon content of the steel. And through forging, the cementite or iron carbide gets organized into sheets. Now there's still some speculation as to how these sheets are organized, whether strong carbide forming elements such as vanadium or chromium are the culprits. And I can say through my own experimentations with small amounts of vanadium, you don't always get that pattern. Chemistry is only one part of the equation, and it really comes down to the combination of all the processes. All right, so all in all, really happy with how the dagger came out, and I'm really happy with the pattern. Um, it just looks awesome. And uh, something I did different with this ingot compared to previous ingots is uh, roast time. And uh, before I was roasting for two hours, and this one I uh, roasted for three, and that made a significant uh, difference uh, in uh, forgeability and pattern. You know, I've done um, a little bit of testing, but this uh, Woots blade right here. I'll be taking with me this summer. Um, hopefully I can cut some uh, flesh with it um, during caribou season or moose season. Um, and I will uh, put it through as much uh, abuse as a mechanic would. <laughs> but uh, other than that, this was uh, really fun and I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you get something out of this video. And I really encourage people to get into this and start making it. It is some awesome and challenging stuff, man. But uh, I will give you a, uh, a warning. It's highly addictive. <laughs> so some of you uh, that get into it, you know, this might, uh, you might um, never want to make uh, Damascus again and just make this because that's how I feel. <laughs> but anyways, a uh, huge shout out to uh, um, Dennis Tyrell and um, Aaron A. Lee of A. Lee Knives, um, you know, for putting this all together and inviting me to this. You know, I, th I think it's really awesome. Um, and a huge shout out to all the uh, other guys that are making daggers in this challenge. Um, props to all of them. I've seen what I've seen a few um, of what those guys have done, and man, they've they've made some beautiful stuff. So. Uh, Get out there and vote for uh, whoever you think made the best dagger. Um, and all I can say is I uh, appreciate you watching. Um, 
And if you have any questions, just ask them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer. And uh, other than that, you guys take care and have a good day.